Well, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Happy Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, a high Sabbath for us. So what a blessing it is to be here and uh, have so many people together in Columbia today. And we really appreciate the Braun family coming down to provide us with a, a very rare special treat of uh, special music here today. So that was uh, very nice. What's the difference between a matzo and a piece of cardboard? <laughs> now you're thinking, not a lot, right? Maybe a little salt. <sighs> cardboard doesn't leave crumbs all over the carpet. <laughs> Do you know what army base is strictly forbidden during the days of Unleavened Bread to visit? Fort Leavenworth. <laughs> and do you know how to drive your mother completely insane during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? It's quite simple. It's a piece of cake. <laughs> Well, in coming up to Passover, we likely had uh, a lot of things on our minds as we prepared for not only the Passover, but the entire Feast of Unleavened Bread. We probably thought about self-exam, hopefully, there before we entered Passover. We probably thought about forgiveness. We took thought about the beating that Jesus Christ took, his crucifixion. Of course, we thought about Israel leaving Egypt, specifically last night, during the night to be much remembered. And of course, those are all very good things that we should think about during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and during the Passover season. But there's another important subject I'd like for us to consider this time of year. One that maybe sometimes we overlook and forget about because we're thinking of all those other subjects. It's a subject that really has to do with the reason why there is a Passover in the Days of Unleavened Bread. If you had to boil it down to one word, you might think uh, love, right? And I think that could be a good argument made for that. God sacrificed his son to give us an opportunity at eternal life, and certainly he did that as an act of love. But that's not what I want to focus specifically on today. What I want to focus on today is related to love. It's something that certainly ancient Israel would have been familiar with, albeit in a, a different way than what you and I are. And in fact, the, the subject is even used in a specific aspect of their ritual worship. The concept I want to talk about today is mercy. Mercy. I want to look at three things specifically today. The way that ancient Israel was familiar with mercy. The way in which you and I should be familiar with mercy, and mercy as we can apply it and practice it today. So today I want us to think about and know how we can better understand and apply mercy. How we can better understand and apply mercy. If you like titles, I've simply titled this message, Having Mercy. Having Mercy. Let's begin with looking at how ancient Israel would understand mercy. First, we have to understand a little bit, in general, how society at that time worked, the culture that ancient Israel existed in. You know, before they were the nation of Israel, they were the children of Israel, and they were coming out of slavery, out of Egypt. At that time, people looked at gods, lowercase g, and, and deities in a, a very different way than the way you and I look at God. They looked at the gods as some sort of an all-powerful being that made humans simply as a, a plaything, maybe a, a little bit of a pet for their amusement. And they existed only to please the god. That was the human being's function, just to, you know, dance and sing, as it were, to entertain the gods. If they please the gods by doing whatever they thought their particular god wanted, then, you know, their god would be happy. Those things could involve all sorts of things, even including human sacrifice, ritual sex, even paying fines and just worshiping them with gold and, and things like that. If they did something wrong, like not engaging in, in all the aforementioned activities, uh, the gods would be angry and something bad would happen to them. By and large, really, these systems were designed as a, a system of ritual demon worship, and they were designed so that people had an excuse to engage in all these lustful carnal habits, and as such, they were wildly popular religions. 
aside from being a completely false system of worship and worshiping false gods and in many cases demons, in fact, these systems lacked mercy. They lacked mercy. If you did something wrong, the priest would decide a punishment. Maybe it was, you know, death. Maybe you would be the next human sacrifice. Maybe it was some sort of a monetary fine or some sort of, you know, sexual act or something like that. There wasn't really any system of mercy or forgiveness in these cultures and religions of the world. So when God, the true God, the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, when he introduces mercy... <laughs> It's really quite a revolutionary concept within the religious community. Now, when you start talking about mercy, it's kind of impossible to talk about mercy without really talking about grace. Uh, some people say that mercy and grace are two sides of the same coin, love. So we don't really have time to go through a, an exhaustive study and review of the nuances between mercy and grace. And in fact, uh, UCG recently put out a booklet on grace, which I highly recommend. But I'd like for us to focus just on the concept of mercy today, to try to narrow it down to that. So we're going to start with an example of mercy in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. At this point in time, God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, a city no doubt and steeped in all of that sort of ritual, sacrifice, and all sorts of other depravity. An angel is sent, and the angel tells Lot he is to escape to the mountains. In Genesis 19, verse 18, we'll pick up the story. It's actually a couple of angels that were sent to Lot. Genesis 19, verse 18, picking up the story, Then Lot said to them, Please know, my Lord, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I can not escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. Now, we're not told what this evil that Lot is concerned about uh, is. Uh, were there enemies, you know, in the mountains? Was the path and the, the travel, was it just too rough a terrain? We don't know. But he asked for mercy, say, you know, please don't, don't make me escape to the mountains. Verse 21 and he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, uh, in that I will not overthrow the city for which you have spoken. Uh, excuse me, I skipped over verse 20. Uh, verse 20 says, See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So, so Lot asks, you know, instead of escaping to the mountains, can I escape to this specific nearby city. And so the, the angel answers, verse 21 says, and he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. So the angel says, okay, I'll have mercy on you. Instead of having to go to the mountains, you can go to this other nearby city. Uh, now, we don't know if that was a, a game time decision that God gave that angel authority to make. Did, you know, was there some sort of instant communication between uh, uh, the Lord and, and this angel to say, okay, yeah, he can go here instead? We're not quite told, but we, are, we do see this as an act of mercy. Let's consider another story quickly. When a bride was being sought out for Isaac, you can begin turning over to Genesis chapter 24 here. Genesis chapter 24. A bride was being sought out for Isaac at this point in time. Abraham's servant headed over to Mesopotamia to find somebody of the, the family uh, of Abraham, someone who was non-Canaanite. And God leads him to the well here where he finds Rebekah. Genesis 24, verse 26 says, Then the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. This is the servant that Abraham had sent. It says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Here we see two merciful acts. One, God has provided a, a bride for Isaac, uh, just as Abraham had desired. And two, God had been merciful to the servant, 
leading him right to the place he needed to go. In all these cases, we see a, an act of physical mercy. There was a physical problem that required a physical answer, and God granted it through an act of mercy. Later on, once the nation of Israel's form, mercy is focused on in a very special sort of a way. I mentioned that at the beginning about how that was even a, the name, the word mercy was right in a part of Israel's ritual worship. If we turn it over to Exodus chapter 25, Exodus verse 25, we read about this special, special part of the ritual worship that they would have been engaged in. Exodus 25, we're going to start in verse 17. So here we see instructions on how the, the Ark uh, of the Covenant, uh, the Ark of the Testimony is made. Verse 17 says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits, a cubit's about 18 inches, about from your elbow to tip, tip your hand, something like that. So fairly good size, maybe about the size of this, this table or this pulpit. So you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The, face, uh, the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. So, you know, if you've seen uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark or any other movie where they depict, you know, a mercy seat, you, you understand what this looks like. You have two uh, cherubim angels and they kind of, you know, have their kind of stretched out like this and their face down towards the mercy seat and their, their wings out forward. And there'd be two, you know, facing each other over top of it. Uh, we don't know how technically accurate that is, but uh, not having the actual Ark to look at, uh, it's uh, good enough for, I think, getting the point across today. Verse 21 continues, it says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So this isn't just a, you know, a decorative sort of thing. This is where God is going to communicate with ancient Israel. This is repeated when God gives instructions uh, for the altar of incense over in Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, verse 6, we won't go through everything, but it tells about how to make the altar of incense. In verse 6, it says, You shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. So this is the point where God is going to communicate through the high priest to ancient Israel. God would give direct teachings from here. We see an example of this over in Numbers chapter 7. Number 7, just go to the very end of number 7 and verse 89. Number 7, verse 89, it says, Now when Moses went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. Thus he spoke to him. So here we see the Lord is communicating to Moses at this point in time. Now, there's a little bit of debate here because, you know, the ark would have been inside the Holy of Holies, right? And it was only the high priest that was supposed to go there. Uh, so was was Moses kind of outside the curtain listening to God? Uh, that seems very much like a possibility. Uh, we do we won't turn there for now, but we do read uh, prior to this in Exodus 33 verse 11. Uh, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses, you know, face to face at one time. So we don't know the exact in and outs of the communication between Moses and the Lord, but it says that the Lord was speaking from the mercy seat to Moses at this point in time. Let's go over to Leviticus 16 as well. Pick up another detail. Leviticus 16. Start in verse 2. 
Leviticus 16, verse 2, and you might read under the heading of this that this is the Day of Atonement. You might wonder why we're talking about that here on the first day of unleavened bread, but we'll get to that in a minute. Leviticus 16, verse 2, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear, I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Uh, the next few verses describes uh, the washings that were necessary by the priest. We heard a little bit about that in the sermonette. Uh, the selection of the bull and the goats and the casting of lots there for specifically the Day of Atonement. But let's pick it up in verse 12. It says, Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with the finger seven times. So the Lord is actually there and present uh, at the time in the cloud above the mercy seat, and the high priest would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. Now you might think again at this point, well that's all interesting, but again, what's that got to do with the days of unleavened bread? Israel was coming out of a society, a society that saw gods as harsh and unforgiving. Remember what we said earlier, that humans basically were there as kind of a plaything to please gods. And even though we know that's not God's true intention behind us, that the true God has doesn't look at us that way, he looks at us as part of his family, potential members of the God family, I think we'll have to agree that Israel's sort of in-person experiences with God had been, uh, you might say, intimidating, to say the least. They saw God kill the firstborn of Egypt. They were spared death only if they followed very specific instructions. They had to stay inside during the Passover meal. They had to sacrifice that lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, as we talked about in yesterday's sermon. When the commandments were given at Sinai, it was a pretty frightening experience there. The thundering, the lightnings, the earthquake. People were so scared they didn't want to talk to God. You can read about that in Exodus 19. They just wanted Moses to relay messages. You know, even being led by a, a cloud and, and a pillar of fire through the Red Sea uh, isn't exactly, you know, a leisurely float down the river. <laughs> You know, it's a pretty powerful experience. It was likely a rather frightening sight to behold. Understanding all that, I think that perhaps we can see why it was so important to have a mercy seat. In spite of these powerful displays of God's magnificence, God wanted Israel to know he was a merciful God, that he was a merciful God. It also gave them the opportunity to communicate directly to him through the high priest right there once a year. Certainly, Israel would put God's mercy to the test. And we don't have time to go through all the various rebellions that they went through there, but we'll just summarize a few. In Exodus 32, you read about the golden calf, you know, when Moses came down off the mountain and they were involved in worshiping this calf. Uh, over Numbers 11, they whined about the manna. Also, God gave them so much quail, they you know, had it coming out their, their nose. Numbers 21, they complained about the journey, so he sent fiery serpents there. Moses' siblings complained about him, and Miriam received a temporary bout of leprosy. Moses himself fell short. He got angry. He smacked the rock instead of talking to it, as he was told to. But perhaps... The greatest shortcoming of all was their outright refusal to enter into the promised land. We read about that over Numbers 14. Numbers chapter 14. And God had spent so much time working with them, leading them to this promised land, bringing them out of Egypt and out of slavery, 
And when the time comes to go there, they don't want to go. Numbers 14, verse 1, it says, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had just died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select the leader and return to Egypt. You know, they had had the spies sent to the promised land. They had seen that the people there were big, and they got scared. They wanted to turn back. Skipping on down to verse 11, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with a pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. God says, I'm ready to wipe these people out and start all over. You know, he was fed up with the complaining and the, the whining. Verse 17, though, we continue in reading, says, And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, so this is uh, Moses speaking, says, Let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of these people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Now, Moses says, you have the right God, of course, to wipe them out, but have mercy. Don't just wipe them all out. Yes, I understand there's going to be punishment for sin, but have mercy on them, please. Don't wipe them out. Verse 20, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. God says, there will be a punishment, but I will have mercy, and I will let then the following generations inherit the promised land. He would not totally destroy them, even though that's what he had, of course, the right to do, and he was ready to do. Moses prayed, Moses intervened for the people, God showed mercy. While they pushed him to his limits over and over, he was consistent in showing mercy. Let's just read one more scripture on this thought in Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. If you don't have this particular chapter marked in your Bible, you might want to mark it. That's what's considered one of the great summary chapters uh, of the uh, Israel's history. And we can kind of see a whole history of God working with a specific people and the different things they went through. So it's uh, a good summary of events. We're just going to pick out a couple verses. Nehemiah 9, verse 18. Nehemiah 9, and verse 18, it says, Even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day, to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night, to show them light and the way they should go. Skipping on down to verse 23, it says, You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go in and possess. Again, God was merciful. He could have just wiped them out and destroyed them completely, but instead he just punished that generation so that their uh, their children and grandchildren could possess the promised land. Israel came to know and recognize that God was a merciful God. Even though there was punishment for sin, there wasn't complete annihilation. They understood him as being merciful, even if they only stood, understood it in a very physical sort of way. 
How about us? Do we look at God as merciful in simply a physical way? Now, it's not that we shouldn't think of God as being merciful in a physical way. He often is. Sometimes we're going through some sort of a, a physical ailment or something, and we pray for God to intervene. Please show me mercy and, and take this pain or this ailment away from And often he does. You know, here in Colombia, we were struggling to find a, a place to, to meet, and we all prayed about it for over the course of months. You know, he intervened and he provided a, a physical hall for us to meet here. Certainly a great blessing. But I hope that we understand God's mercy on a much higher level than just that physical level. Let's turn to the New Testament and begin reading in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're actually going to read quite a bit of this today. Hebrews 9. Was mentioned a bit in the sermonette, as well as a couple other scriptures I was going to today. So I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I may be in trouble. But actually, it worked out very well. I was going to fit uh, hand in glove, as they say. So I'm very appreciative of how God works those things out. So he's merciful to you that you don't have to hear the same message. <laughs> Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, verse 1. We'll begin. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary, where, in the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or we sometimes call the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on, on, on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. This is uh, the writer of Hebrews, uh, I believe it was Paul, basically saying uh, we're going to summarize for time <laughs> here. He was uh, summarizing uh, some of those things that we read about earlier. So he describes that mercy seat that we read about in Exodus chapter 25. Verse 6, it says, Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part of the high uh, excuse me, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. Now that description we read about, the sprinkling of blood there on the mercy seat, is what he's referring to here. It was for the forgiveness of sins, basically for a year's worth of sins there in Israel. Verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit uh, indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Now, that's something to consider. You know, the Holy Spirit wasn't in people. That's how God communicates with us today. At that point in time, it was just above that cloud over the mercy seat. Hadn't yet been poured out on the people. Verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. You know, all the physical acts and all the physical bulls, the blood, the goats, everything that was offered... You know, those are physical acts. That didn't necessarily change a person's mind and heart. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinance imposed in the until the time of Reformation. Again, as was mentioned in the sermonette, all those sacrifices pointed to Jesus Christ. Verse 11, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, what does the mercy seat have to do with the Feast of Unleavened Bread? It's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we focus so much on on Passover that allowed his blood to be poured, as it were, on the mercy seat, quite literally, as they say, to cover sin once and for all. Once and for all. 
Again, remember why that mercy seat was so special was because that's where God communicated from. It was only through Jesus Christ's sacrifice where God communicated through, uh, had previously communicated only there through the mercy seat. It's only through Jesus Christ's sacrifice that we can have God's Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, so that he can communicate with us directly. So quite literally, that blood was poured out as a forgiveness once and for all. Now, his blood wasn't poured on the mercy seat itself, just to clarify that. Uh, it was symbolically uh, poured, but not, not literally. Verse 13, it says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, Israel didn't have the blessing that you and I have. They didn't have that opportunity to have God's Spirit dwelling inside them. You know, we don't get just a, a harsh correction for when we sin. You know, when they began to, uh, when, when Miriam, for example, began to talk badly about Moses, you know, she received a harsh correction. She received a temporary case of leprosy. That's pretty, you know, that was basically a death sentence. Of course, God was merciful and took it away after a week. You know, we have something much better. John 14, 26, don't need to turn there. But we have a helper that dwells in us, that teaches us all things and brings to remembrance God's Word. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Things that say, you know what, Dan, maybe you shouldn't have done that, or said that, or whatever. You know, no, we don't get that lightning bolt that comes out of the sky that says, bam, don't do that. No, we get a gentle correction. Verse 15, And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal, of eternal inheritance. Now, we receive mercy on a much greater level than what ancient Israel ever did. They were shown the mercy of not being immediately cut off for this sin. But, you know, they were never promised eternal life. Now we understand, you know, through Ezekiel 37 and other passages, they will have an opportunity at the second resurrection. But they were never given that promise in their lifetime. The extent of the mercy they received was not being wiped out immediately at that day. Consider what Peter wrote over in 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1. First Peter chapter 1, we'll start in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, we've received a promise of eternal life in spite of our sins, an incorruptible inheritance. No, Israel received a corruptible inheritance. It was a promised land, and indeed it became corrupted, and they lost it. Now, Peter reminds us, we are set, we are promised an incorruptible inheritance, one that won't fade away. We can be born again in that sense. We can be a new man, different than our carnal nature. Now, we know and understand that it's not just a one-time thing. We have to continue to live obediently. We have to continue to worship God, and it's an ongoing process. We have to ask for repentance of our sin, but we can be a new man. As firstborn heirs to the kingdom of God, we have received mercy on a greater level than Israel ever did. Having God's Holy Spirit in us should help us to live better than they ever did. We should be able to rise above those carnal lusts and desires, the temptation of the, the golden calf or the perfect donut or that whatever thing you might smell over the course of this coming week. 
you know, the easy life back in Egypt, the easy life that we used to have before we knew and understood, oh, wait, I, I actually have to live differently. I don't not just live differently, by the way. I have to think differently. I have to be different. The temptation of going back to that life of sin, to go back to Egypt. Yet somehow, we're not above those things, are we? We still stumble. We still fall short. In fact, we turn over to Romans chapter 3. Let's consider this point for a moment. Romans chapter 3. Let's read verse 21. Romans chapter 3. We'll start in verse 21. It says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and prophets. You know, the law, the prophets, all the things that uh, Moses was instructed to set up in the tabernacle, the covenant, the mercy seat, all those things showed what God expected. They showed what mercy, or excuse me, uh, what righteousness uh, should how right, rightness righteousness should be practiced. They revealed it. But God in his mercy shows us a better way without the need of that animal sacrifice through his Holy Spirit. Verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all and all on all who believe, for there is no difference. You know, there's a connection there between Passover and unleavened bread. We're reminded this opportunity, you know, it only exists because of that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's the only way that we can live this very mercy-filled life. It's through his sacrifice. Verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't think that's news to any of us here. <laughs> I think we recognize we all fall short of the glory of God. It's a reminder. Verse 24, it says, being justified freely, no, it is a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, God justifies us freely through grace. Grace and mercy are, it's kind of impossible to talk about one without the other. Uh, a very basic sort of a difference uh, that I might give is this. Grace is favor from God, whether we deserve it or not. Mercy is what God shows us through grace when we most definitely don't deserve it. Oh, I'll repeat that one more time. Grace is favor from God, whether we deserve it or not. Mercy is what God shows us through grace when we most definitely don't deserve it. Continue reading in Chapter 25, excuse me, verse uh, th chapter 3, verse 25. <clears throat> says, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. You know what propitiation actually translates as? If you have a New King James Version uh, and you look in your center column reference, you'll see it says mercy seat. Christ was the mercy seat in that sense. Verse 25 uh, says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Uh, is it not what we talked about at Passover? No, it doesn't mean turning a blind eye, pretending it didn't happen. It says, no, I acknowledge it, but because I'm a merciful God, I forgive it. I'm going to pass over the death sentence that we all deserve. Because Jesus Christ was and is the mercy seat, God is willing to pass over our sins, even though with his Holy Spirit, we should know better. Again, of course, it's an ongoing process. We must repent when we do sin, and it's not an excuse just to live how we want. We do need to try and give it our full effort to abide by his word, by his law. Verse 26, it says, To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God does this to show his righteousness to us. 
You know, remember what we read in verse 21? It says the righteousness was shown by the law and the prophets. And why there was a concept of mercy there at that time? God has revealed to us a much more abundant mercy through the living mercy seat, Jesus Christ. Israel couldn't manage to bring their sinful ways to a complete halt. They messed up along the way, and they came to rely on God's mercy to keep from being completely destroyed. Likewise, try as we might, as mere mortal humans, we can never quite seem to get sin out of our lives. And while in some respects we may say that's simply a part of being human, I hope it makes us realize something important during the feast, during this time when we try and refocus our efforts to keep sin out of our life. I hope it makes us realize that more than Israel ever did, we need God's mercy. Consider this. What if God had not been merciful to ancient Israel? What if he would have wiped them out for any one of those rebellions? There, then and there, completely. What if he would have wiped them all out for worshiping the golden calf or complaining about the manna or refusing to enter the promised land? What if he annihilated them instead of just having them wander around for 40 years in the first generation or two not being able to enter? Well, certainly they'd be very upset at that moment when they were being wiped out. And yes, perhaps the Egyptians would have thought less than God, or less of God, for a moment. But for those people, if God had not shown mercy, they wouldn't have really lost anything in the big picture. No, they hadn't had their opportunity at salvation yet. They'll still have that during the second resurrection. Whether God showed them mercy or not at that time, it wasn't their day of salvation. They only lost out on a physical blessing. The same is not true for you and I. The same is not true for us. We understand 1 Peter 4, verse 17, you don't need to turn there, but it reminds us that the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. That is, His church, His people, you and I. Far more than those who came out of Egypt in that day, you and I need mercy. They wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And yes, they will need God's mercy to enter into the kingdom of God, just as you and I do. But as firstborn, as partakers of the Holy Spirit, you and I must rely on that mercy now. Today is our day of judgment. We need Christ's blood to cover that mercy seat to forgive our sins now. I think you can see then how much more in that sense we are reliant on God's mercy than what Israel was at that time. I mentioned at the beginning today that I wanted to talk about not only how ancient Israel would have understood mercy and how we should understand it. But I want to begin to conclude today with how we can practice, how we can implement mercy. I could probably go through another, you know, five points on showing mercy to one another. But I think you're going to see, as we read through this next section of Scripture, the answer is very, very simple. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I want to read through the parable here of the unforgiving servant. I know we've all read through this several times, but I'd like for us to consider it knowing how much we do rely on God's mercy, how much we rely on it with this being our day of judgment, our day of salvation. Matthew 18, verse 21, 
It says, Then Peter came to him, that of course being Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and forgive him? Up to seven times? You know, in essence, Peter's asking, Lord, how much mercy do I actually have to show people? <laughs> What's the minimum I can do and get away with? Jesus Christ's answer says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. No, this, you know, doesn't mean 490. He's just saying uh, much more than you think you do <laughs> by comparison. Probably more than you think you need to. Verse 23 he goes into the parable, says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he should be sold, his wife and his children, and all that he had, that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. It says the master was, re was moved with compassion. I think at this point in time, compassion and synonym and uh, mercy would be a good synonym. You know, the master was moved with mercy. Figuratively speaking here, the master, the servant go, going before the master, it's like the high priest would go before God who would appear above the cloud on that mercy seat. He's communicating with him and say, please, Lord, please, Forgive this man of his sins. That blood of that bull is sprinkled upon the mercy seat, and the master forgives, just as God forgave Israel. Continuing in verse 28, it says, But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. You know, I've seen all kinds of mathematical estimates on what you know, ten thousand talents versus a hundred denarii is. Uh, basically, it would be you know, try to think about the national debt of the United States versus the pocket change you have in your wallet right now. It's 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 no comparison. Okay, it's no comparison. It says owed him a few hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, "Pay me what thou owe." So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, "Have patience with me, and I will pay you all." And he would not, but went and threw him into prison until he should pay for the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved, and they came and told their master all that he had done. Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you and all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion, had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. This would be like if the high priest went in there once a year, took the blood, sprinkled it on the mercy seat, and God said, No, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to forgive you, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and wipe out everyone, the entire nation of Israel, right now. That would be the analogy, so to speak. Christ is making a very clear point here, and he concludes in verse 35, it says, So my heavenly Father will also do to you, if it do uh, to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I think the answer is pretty clear on how we show mercy. We need to think about how Jesus Christ is that mercy seat. How it's because of that you and I are forgiven our sins. And for us not to forgive others, not to show mercy to them, would be like Jesus Christ had never been sacrificed for our sin. There's a story I heard once about mercy. Don't know if it's true or not. It's supposedly about Napoleon's army. Napoleon was, of course, uh, a, a military, a war genius. Uh, he uh, was, you know, one of the greatest generals of all time. He was also very, very strict. And the worst thing you could do in the T Napoleonic army was desert. If you left, if you ran away, the punishment without question was death. Well, a young man deserted the army. He had been caught, he was brought back, and he was going to be executed for his crime. The mother of this young man got word, and he came. She came before Napoleon, and she said to him, she began to beg for his life and said, Please have mercy 
and spare my son's life. Napoleon said, Why should I show him mercy? He's done nothing to deserve an act of mercy. The soldier's mother replied, If he had done anything to earn it, it wouldn't be an act of mercy. As the story goes, Napoleon was so moved that he spared the young man's life. Those who wrong us in some way, you know, they may not deserve mercy. They may, in fact, deserve a severe punishment. Even if it's in our right to exact a punishment, you know, uh, whatever that might be, uh, a lawsuit, a tongue lashing, whatever it is. As recipients of such great mercy, of the blood of Jesus Christ on that mercy seat, we need to stop and consider showing mercy ourselves. The blood of Jesus Christ done in his death, that once and for all sacrifice, is a blood that forgives our sins as well as others. You can't take away forgiveness of someone else without taking it away from yourself. Without the mercy associated with it, no sin can be forgiven. Not yours, not mine, not theirs. Ancient Israel understood mercy in a very physical sort of way. They deserved utter destruction for their sins. Instead, they only received 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and a few generations perhaps losing entrance into the promised land. For us, we should understand mercy at a much deeper level, beyond mere physical punishments. We are extended mercy through God's grace and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And because that mercy is extended to us, we have the promise, the hope of eternal life. As we go through this next week, thinking about unleavened bread and thinking about the sin in our lives and focus on getting it out and keeping it out, and certainly we should do that. Let's not just think about those sorts of things, but let's take time to think about the forgiveness God gives when sin does occur. And let's remember that living mercy seat, Jesus Christ. <music>